The key difference between steady state and unsteady state heat transfer problems is that in unsteady state, time is now a factor. So temperatures can change not only with location in the system like they do in steady state, but they also change with time. What steady state actually means is that formally, time derivatives go to zero. Informally, there are no changes with time. Unsteady state means there's changes with time. So we have to account for those changes over time when we are trying to find the amount of heat transferred from one place to another. or we're trying to find how long something takes to get to a certain temperature. Let's take a look at an unsteady state heat transfer problem. Here's a sample unsteady state heat transfer problem that's looking at different object shapes. When we solve unsteady state heat transfer problems, the shape of the object does matter because that means that the heat transfer happens a different way. For the purposes of this problem, we are assuming one-dimensional unsteady state heat transfer, so the heat is only being transferred in one direction. Any more complicated than that, and we have to result to partial derivatives and a numerical solver. But here, if we use one dimension, the math stays pretty nice, and we have simple equations that we can use to solve this problem. Here we've got our two shapes, a sphere and a cylinder. Again, shape is going to matter. The food product, though, is the same. So it has the same physical properties. It's just a different shape. We take those two shapes, we drop them into a deep fryer, and the shapes will heat up over time. So we want to figure out how long is it going to take, given the information in our problem, for these objects to reach ADC. We'll start out by drawing our diagram. Okay, so we have our sphere and our cylinder. They are sitting in an oil bath. And notice that I have labeled the critical dimension for the cylinder and the sphere, as well as the temperatures on the sphere, the cylinder, and the oil. This will become important when we're looking at how to solve this problem. There are several different equations for solving unsteady state heat transfer problems. First one is the unaccomplished temperature fraction. And that equation looks like this. In this equation, we're looking at how much temperature change still needs to be accomplished. So here, Ta is the fluid that's doing the heat transfer. Ti is the initial temperature of your object, and T is the temperature of your object at time little t. So at the very start of the process, when time is zero, T is equal to Ti, and your unaccomplished temperature fraction is one, because you still have all the temperature change to accomplish. After a very, very long time, T is equal to Ta, and your unaccomplished temperature fraction is zero because you've already accomplished all the temperature change that you're going to in this system. Your heat transfer fluid and your object are at the same temperature, so there's no way thermodynamically any of those objects is going to change temperature. Another equation we need to solve this problem is for the bio number. You may have heard this pronounced bio. It doesn't matter really how you pronounce it as long as you get the equation right. And that equation looks like this. All right, if you think back to steady state heat transfer, you might think, well, is this really the bio number? Because this looks like the Nusselt number equation. It is. We still need to understand the rate of convective transfer here represented by H versus the rate of conducted heat transfer represented by K. DC is our critical dimension. In unsteady state heat transfer, assuming that your objects are completely floating and surrounded on all sides by your heat transfer fluid, DC is the radius of a sphere and the radius of a cylinder. So heat is coming into or out of those objects in the radial dimension. That is our one dimension of heat transfer through the direction of the radius. 
We need to calculate the bio number before we do anything else because we need to figure out what's dominating. Is it convective heat transfer or is it conductive heat transfer? Let's go ahead and do that. The problem gives us all the information we need to solve for the bio number. Okay, our bio number is 16.4. If the bio number is greater than 40, that means convective heat transfer is very fast and what's controlling the rate of heat transfer is conduction. If the bio number is less than 0.1 then that means conductive heat transfer is very fast and convection is what's controlling the rate of heat transfer. But when the bio number is between 0.1 and 40 that means conduction and convection are both controlling the rate of heat transfer and that's the case we have right here. So because our bio number is 16.4, we need to use what's called the Heisler charts to figure out how fast this heat transfer is going to happen. Now I'm not going to show you the Heisler charts here, but I will give you the value off of the Heisler chart for these particular systems. Keep in mind that the Heisler charts are different for different shapes. So there is a Heisler chart for spheres, a chart for cylinders, and a chart for flat slabs. So we're going to have different results off the Heisler chart based on shape. We have one of the quantities we need for the Heisler chart. That's our bio number. The second one we need is the unaccomplished temperature fraction. So let's go ahead and calculate that for this system. It's going to be the same for both shapes because we're trying to get the shapes to the same final temperature. All right. Our unaccomplished temperature fraction is 0.787. So we still have a good amount of temperature change to be accomplished, but considering the oil is at 300 C and we want the food to end at 80 C, yeah, that makes sense that we really would have a lot of temperature change left to accomplish if we actually left the food in there for a very, very long time until it reached 300 C. So that's a reasonable answer. If we look on the Heisler charts for cylinders and spheres, what we're going to look up is the Fourier number. And the Fourier number, which we'll see the equation for in just a minute, is equal to 0.12 for cylinders and 0.1 for spheres. So there's just a little bit of difference in the Fourier number, but that actually will make a large difference in time. Let's take a look at the equation for Fourier number to see how that happens. Okay, the Fourier number is equal to the thermal conductivity times the time that has gone by since we put the food in the oil bath, divided by the density of the food, the specific heat of the food, and the critical dimension of our objects squared. Let's rearrange that to solve for T. All right. The only difference we have here between our cylinder and our sphere is the Fourier number itself. Our critical dimension is the same and it's the same food so it has the same physical properties. So let's solve for the time needed to heat the sphere versus the time needed to heat the cylinder. And there you have it. It takes 131 more seconds to heat our cylinder versus our sphere to that final temperature. So this demonstrates that shape does have a significant impact on how quickly heat transfer happens under unsteady state conditions. So go ahead, play around with different critical dimensions. Here we had the same critical dimension. So play around with different critical dimensions and see how does that affect rate of heat transfer? Is there ever a time when a cylinder has faster heat transfer than a sphere or is sphere always faster? What about a slab? Try out using a slab with that particular critical dimension. Note that the critical dimension for a slab is half its thickness. Now that we've gone through a good number of heat transfer problems, you might be thinking, well, how am I going to tell all these types of problems apart? I'll give you a 
key hint for unsteady state versus steady state. Look for time. If you see how long does it take or when will this reach a certain temperature, that's likely to be unsteady state. If there's not much of a mention of time, if you're just asked what happens at a single location or a single moment in time, what happens right then after you add something, or right then under those conditions, that is steady state. So keeping that in mind can help you keep some of these heat transfer problems straight.